on my side, I, I don't know how to grow. I can kill a plastic plant. This is not, you know, so then you'd have to say, well, this is, maybe we have something else to do right now. But I have to see if they have the, the this little changer. Is this changer? I guess I'll go this way and see what it does. I'll go the other way and see what that does. Maybe I just won't touch it. I'll do this. That works. So what we're going to talk about is a little bit of an introduction. And then we're just going to talk about what the classification is. We're going to talk a little bit about um, crude. What is crude? Let us be crude. Because um, every single plant comes from a different part of the, of the uh, varieties. And what you're trying to grow is important. But it's also heading towards what you're seeing for a formulation centric. Whenever anyone asks me, like, what's the best extraction? And we'll talk about that. The best extraction is only you, you keep the integrity of the plant that you're making. But you're always starting off with formulation-centric. What does a patient need? What, does, what are you trying to make? What, what attribute are you trying to solve? And from there, then you move back through. Because you have all of these different, uh, you'll have to get used to the fact that I'm going to move. You have all of these different things that are the major components in a plant. And the cannabis plant just happens to have a, a lot of these cannabinoids. But it's got sesquiterpenes, it's got terpenes, flavonoids, sugar, pigments, chlorophyll, fat, waxes, lignans, I mean, all the typical things that a plant has. And yet you're trying, at this point in time, the industry has moved more and more, and I, I, I realize it's brutal, but they're taking the tusk off the elephant and just leaving it there. And so some of the things that I'm seeing is that the THC uh, more dominant um, varieties versus the CBD dominant varieties because now I have a different set of uh, people growing them. And so the different set of people are, are the farmers. So I'm a fifth generation dairy farmer from Vermont. I ran away from home at 28 and I didn't go back. No matter how many times, you've got to come run the family. No, no, no. I'm, Barbara Jane's doing just fine. I'll stay out here and make a living. And so that's what happens. But when you're looking at that, the farmers keep going back through, what can I do with the waste? Because what the THC people saw was waste and they throw away, they're going, well, that's my next part of my product. And so as we're moving through the process, no matter which part that you see here, it's still going to move towards the product. So these are nice pictures of an ancient uh, cannabis plant. I believe it's 2,500 years old in a shaman's grave. So this is an article written by Ethan Rousseau. I, I always put the references down here, so when I talk about peer-reviewed References, I'm not kidding. I don't, I don't do YouTube University. Um, I just don't. And so these, these are actual plants. Uh, these are actual photographs from that 25-year-old shaman, 25,000-year-old, uh, 2,500-year-old, uh, 2, and he's in the desert. There's no cannabis in the desert, so they had to have brought it all the way down from the mountains down to this, and it was so important that they put it in his grave, which is really strange. So when you go back through, it shows how important it is. When you start to think about where cannabis came from through our history, it had to be fairly important because if you only had six or seven canoes, it's not as though you had the Mayflower moving van taking you across an ocean to go across from you know, China over to Alaska or, or across to Hawaii. I mean, Hawaii, they weren't dropped into Hawaii. There were no air, airplane flights coming into Hawaii. And so, but they brought cannabis with them. That's how important it is. So somewhere along the way, it had to be important. But these are all the other things they found. So this is a 2004 paper, I think. And since that time, they found other ones. I also enjoy all the things I hear about Ole Miss. So Dr. Osoli, um, know him personally. And uh, in fact, when I was at Waters, we donated $5 million worth of equipment to help him move along. And uh, because he was doing hexane, I was like, no hexane. And, and also doing a lot of papers. So if you read some of the papers on, the, on what they're doing for evaluation, it's very important. They were doing GC. They were doing gas chromatography and, and then sending it up to um, 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 RIT, RIT, Research Triangle Institute, RTI. And that's where they would do all the, the cigarettes. And so everyone goes, you know, it's terrible. They were the only one. But El Soli, Dr. Soli was always begging the government, give me another one, give me another one. But they only gave him those varieties until around 2016. He got 14 more varieties and was able to grow a whole 2,500 plants. So if you haven't seen the photographs, it's a good joke because there's wire all around it so that the plants won't escape. There's a lot of things in there. But also as you start to look at all the different parts, the thing that's also amusement to me is it's not just one CBD and there's not just one Delta-9. 
there's nine isomers of delta-9. So everyone goes, oh, it's just delta-9. I'm going, no, it's not. It's nine isomers of delta-9. Uh, two of delta-8. You look at the CBD. Where is my CBD? I thought there was, there's seven isomers of CBD because that's the way the molecule is. Where the positions of the, of the electrons and where the positions of the carbons and the oxygens are all important. I, so, I'm, so I have a PhD in synthetic chemistry. I will get it out there for all the youth and all that want to leave now. And, and, and so I really am like Breaking Bad. He had a PhD in organic chemistry, so do I. He was at a company, so was I. But I haven't murdered anyone and I don't bring along young people with me anymore because I know that ends badly. <laughs> but I do like chicken. So if you look at this compound, as you well know in, in organic chemistry, the oxygen is red, right? We all know that. And carbon is black. And, and, and all hydrogens are, are white. I'm so proud of you sitting in the front row. I was telling me, it's like the blue man group. So as soon as I move towards you, you start to go, oh my God, he's not going to spit on me. So that's true. So this is THC. And then you have CBD over here. And so the molecule has more rotation. But these blue carbons are why the plant is so important. It makes a specific isomer because that's what plants do. They come down and they make specific isomers. So what synthetic chemists do, and what I made a career out of, six years to get a PhD, I wasn't the brightest person there, let's be honest. And so all my friends, were, they were on their jobs after two, you know, I'm still go, I still got a couple years because I have to learn chemistry. And so if I go back through, it's very important that they ma it makes one isomer. It makes a small amount of, this is trans, it's trans because the, these, these um, green hy uh, hydrogens are opposite each other. So that's called trans. So what they do is, they, is they, these are special, and the, and the plant makes this. Nine isomers, it makes one. When we start to extract, that's when we do bad things to it. So I'm going to take off these carbons. I did it yesterday, sir, all three people that were in my conference yesterday. So yeah, it was very popular until they started charging. The, um, so I have this. Oh, is this on? So, the, uh, so if I look at this. I, got, I have these five carbons on the end, right? So if that's TH delta 9, minus minus delta 9, and if, I, that's, and if I take these two off, because that's a separate molecule, then it only has three carbons. That's THCV, right? So now I have THC and I have THCV. So I, THC is an appetite stimulant. And purported through anecdotal and through science that THCV is what? Appetite suppressant. How does it know? It's only two carbons. But it's true. So that's how important the isomers are. That's how important the specific molecule is. So when we're looking at all these things, and then you have to say to yourself, what has that got to do with growing? Well, pretty much everything. So these are, these are apples. I tell people, forget about cannabis. Think apples. And the reason I think apples is because when I go to Whole Foods, I don't walk into Whole Foods and tell me, can you show me where your apple strains are? Strains are for bacteria, they're for other things. You go for a variety. Where are your varieties? So keep that in your mind. So we can't have a variety in the United States because to have a variety, you have to register it. And because it's a class one illegal drug, we do, we t the US government typically doesn't register drugs. Call it silly, but you, that's how you would do it. I've got some really good cocaine. I have a really good variety for my cocaine. Oh gosh, please come register. Could you patent that? So if I go back through, I have apples, think apples. You have green apples, you have red apples, you have delicious apples, you have Macintosh apples, but each apple is used for a different thing. You do not use a Macintosh apple and, and, and use it for apple juice. That's a bad idea. But at the same time, I wouldn't use some Washington delicious thing to make a nice apple crisp. I want to have a little bit of snap to it, and I want to have juice in it. And you, if you have a dried apple, you have a really bad apple crisp. It doesn't matter how much oatmeal and brown sugar you put on it, though that's not a bad thing. You, you still, you, you can't mask the fact that it's bad. Plus, he has a Boston Red Sox hat on when we actually had a good team. The other one is eggs. There's different type of eggs. And, and actually, they're not written on over here. That you can do that through a software. But if you go back through, you have, because the chicken doesn't go, oh my gosh, it didn't come out with a name. And so you go back through, and, but each one of those, I mean, I remember weighing the eggs with my grandmother. I had the small eggs, the big eggs, and we'd, we'd drive them to the market in our 1948 Ford, and I'd just sit in the front seat with no seatbelt on, going, whoa, where are we going? And so you go through, but eggs are the same thing. There's different eggs that you use for different parts, right? 
That's the same thing with can cannabis, cannabinoids. And there's also things that you can do with eggs. You can make hard-boiled eggs, rocky eggs. You can do rocky movies. You can do all kinds of things. But all those things are important. This is a real field. These are pictures that I took. That's where it started out with. That was probably um, early April on the, the smaller side. And then over on the other side is one that I took, oh, maybe about a month and a half ago. And those are tall. See the little flag in front? The little flag in front is one that I flagged. So I have 17 million plants growing. And when you have 17 million plants, there's a good chance that they're not all identical. Another big surprise. So as I go back through, I find one. So I squeeze that little guy there, and, and that little guy smelled like banana, um, banana, uh, a blueberry. Really weird. But, you know, you take a picture of that, and you, and you keep moving forward. Well, this is me. I was kind of hoping I was going to move. I'll move over here. Maybe it moves when I touch it. There I am. This is the size of about four weeks ago. I'm doing, this is my field of dreams thing. This is my field of dreams. <laughs> you know, I, I, and I, I really do do the shoeless thing here. Where am I? They're now 14 and 15 feet high. I may be smiling now, but I'm not going to be smiling in about five weeks when I have to harvest 500 acres of this stuff. Then I'm going to be, I can't believe it. Let me go. I have a Syracuse shirt on because my, my daughter went to Syracuse. So that's not Stanford. There's another university that has S in front of it, just in case you didn't. This is another picture I took. So I can measure a plant from the time it's three weeks old. With, and this is, this is a separate, this is not a sales pitch. This happens to be a toy that I use. I use other toys. It just happens to be that I have this toy with me. So I can take this toy out to the middle of nowhere. I can lay it on the ground, and I can take plants. And three weeks, I know when they're three weeks old, I know what their ratio is. I don't know what it's finally going to make for grams, but I know what the ratio is. So when you're in the hemp business, it's really good to find out if they have THC in the beginning. Because if you're in North Carolina, they find one thing with greater than 0.3 THC at any point in time, and they mow down your field. They do it in, uh, in uh, Kern County. They did it last week. This, this plant is hot. Boom. That took away a whole crop. That farmer was not happy. That means that you've gone in and you've done the um, Kansas thing with Dorothy. Where are all the cows? I don't know. Lollipop man. So anyhow, so if you look at that, these are called sisal trichomes. So you can have the sisal trichomes, even from three weeks old, these trichomes have the same ratio of what the plant has. When you've got blue eyes when you're, when you're born, or three weeks afterwards, wherever that is, you're going to have blue eyes when you're 30. Your eyes aren't changing. You've changed in size, but your eyes haven't changed. That's the same thing. So there's enough data that I'll show you on other things on how you do those ratios to make sure that you know what that ratio is. But these thistle trichomes, they're still trichomes. They're still doing the same chemistry. This is another picture I took, a little bit of a close-up. Those are the thistle trichomes. So early on, it's already got, they're underneath the leaf. So when I have people do that, I'm always having people say, yeah, I, I, got, I took samples. I'm just like, and I watch them. They pull them off, the, 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 and I'm just like, well, you've got, more, you've got more cannabinoids on your fingers than you possibly have anywhere else. So you have to take a little snip. You take the tweezers, and you, you cut it off, and it goes into the little container, and you've already got a pre-weighed container, so you know what to do. Also, it turns out they have moisture, another big surprise. So you know, it's probably 65% moisture in a typical plant. That's what I do. So, so when you get it, and they talk about dry weight, whenever they do the cannabinoids and you buy something from someone, they're doing the dry weight. So they dry it, and that's the amount that you have in. When you're wet, it's not the same thing. There's, it's pretty simple math that water's taking up part of that number. These are the other little guys. This is the little one that's just starting out. It's barely getting out. And so, but you also have globular. You have the bulbous ones. See these little guys here? Those are early on, too. They're underneath the leaf. You have the sisal trichomes, and you have the bulbous uh, trichomes. They're very small. And so when I'm telling people to extract, <laughs> I tell them not to take 90% is fine, because if you've got the sisal trichomes, I'm from New England. And, and in New England, we, um, we have things called lobsters. I want to know the first guy who has lobsters. I have a theory about lobsters. I have a theory about a lot of foods. I believe there was a lot of cannabis, and they're both on the beach. I tell you what, I'm hungry. There's some crawling. Let's go eat that thing. 
Who thought, of, who thought of going into the ocean, grabbing this thing out and going, I think that's food. You know, I don't think so. I want to know that person. But that, they never recorded it. And if they did, he'd probably, because he died, he'd probably the first one, I'll take it raw. And so you go back through. But when you're at a, at, a, at a lobster bake, the guy who's at the end of the table sucking on the little legs, let him sit over there. Eat the claws. That's where all the meat is. This is the beginning of a bud. And you can see there's little, little trichomes there. A little movie I made of it because I like to go in and out like the lunar lander. What was the name of the movie where the, where the plant ate it? Remember the plant that ate Little Shop of Horrors? Tell me that doesn't look like Little Shop of Horrors. It does to me. I wouldn't come near that little sucker. This is one that I took a picture of out in the field. It's got a lot of little things on it. Anyone want to guess what the little things are? Yeah, it's, it's not, the, but it's the pollen from all the males and all the, all the uh, pollen. <laughs> it's sticky. That's why it works, right? I kind of like that movie. It's kind of, I, I like to move it. So what, what did I do with this? This is my $105 Amazon that sticks into my computer. I mean, I went full tilt on this puppy. And that's, that's all you need. You don't need a whole lot of tools to be able to know what you have out in your field. You really don't. You just have to be able to to move forward and just be able to see this one. This is a picture. <laughs> Thank you, John. Oh my gosh, he's so intelligent. So this is, I, what I did is I, is I cut open a, um, a hemp plant, and this is the stuff that you're making all your hempcrete out of. So typically what they do is that's this outside layer. You take off this outside layer, and you take, and you take this one. Has anyone cut open a... Uh, a, or try to bend open a, 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 a hemp plant, you, it doesn't work, does it? That's why hempcrete is really, really good. That's why clothing works really, really well. That's why I probably ought to sit over here and not. So that's why it is. So for me, that's part of the elephant. We're throwing away all the stuff that we can make hempcrete on. So those are all the things that I think are positive, that you're starting to look at different varieties and what you want to do growing. This is a question always people ask me, you know, what influenced me and why do I know? It's because every day I wake up and I read for about an hour, hour and a half. I read patents, I read papers every single day. So I'd say six out of seven days. Something happens on one of the days that I don't, but that's what, it's an accumulated knowledge since 2013. Since November, October of 2013, I get up every single day. So now it's up to six years. But that's, and then the rest of the day I live it. But you know, that's what I do as I, as I read the papers. And so some of the stuff that you'll see, and people ask me about, you know, what's the best extraction? People have seen this before. I make it into this. B is my most important thing, whether you're growing, you're extracting, or you're making products. Botanical materials integrity maintained to assure the concentration of the desired components in their natural form. The minute you start doing other things that are unnatural, nothing good is coming next. E for me is extraction because you're still trying to provide that. If you give someone a natural product, they're going to extract it because it's going into their body. You've just picked a different route to do that. So even if I have a hemp cigarette, I still have CBD and all of its friends. And safety is critical. So it, it turns out OSHA is a real organization. Who would have thunk it? And it turns out as you move through the manufacturing, there's no reason that cannabis isn't moving into the OSHA world also. Why would you wear helmets? Why would you wear gloves? You, you watch the young people. I remember before in the early days, you'd walk into a place and they're in there with the scissors. You know, you got the dog there, you're making scissors. I'm sitting there going, oh my God. And so that's when you, I didn't really do that because that would have been rude. I go, oh, perhaps we should get some different scissors, like medical scissors that don't shear, you know, the CVS ones. And so, but they would do that. And so I thought safety of that. But then the young people that are doing the, um, the sizzle, it, it goes right. The reason your hands get all spiky, walk into a hemp field without, without, a, without a cover all on and you come out really itchy, really itchy. That's because you've gone through and spiked yourself with lots of those sisal trichomes. They're sharp. Do you know how you get rid of it? CBD oil. It's a classic. I died. I just like, really? And then testing with modern equipment. So you can do paper chromatography, but as I often say, you, you've got to be able to walk through the entire system and know what you're doing. The most incredible amounts can be just done with thin layer. So I always look at this. I'm, you go to every single show. How many people is this the first show you've been to? Oh my gosh. 
it's, it's, it's crazy to me. You know, as I watch each show, I see it's their very first one. So you look at that and you say, oh, there's not that many people. And to me, wait, are you planning on going to the one in Las Vegas? When, oh, it's the first week in December? Last, it went from, the first one I went to had like 300 people in Denver. We were in a basement of a, of a small tech center. And then it got bigger, and then it got bigger. And last year was 28,000 people. And this year there's probably going to be 35, 40,000 people. This is what it looks like. And that's on a good day. So you have to, if you don't like anyone touching you, you you're, you're, you're now on a Japanese train heading for work early in the morning. Because this is how you're going to go through. Oh, that looks good. I can see that. That works. That works. What is that thing? Holy sugar. So I had someone that, didn't, that they were supposed to hire me last year to walk them through the show. And then they called up and said, well, we're not going to need you. I said, well, that's fine. I got enough stuff to do. I'm fine. Didn't send me any money, so that works too. And so I go back through, and, uh, and I see them halfway through. They're probably it was 11 in the morning or 11.30 in the first day in their eyes. They happen to run into me going, we have no idea what we're looking at. I said, no, you don't. Have a nice day. <laughs> I know when I'm not needed, and it wasn't today. And so this is what, you go in with a plan. You've got to figure out all the different things that are there, figure out what you do. When you have the first day, just let the first day go. Just roll with it. Just go, all right, I'm not going to know anything I'm looking at, but tomorrow I'll have a plan. All right, so cannabinoids. They're affected. This is actually how they grow. So the next few slides I've taken um, from a chapter six with John McPartland. So I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Vermont College of Medicine School of Pharmacology for cannabis. And for the other students that are in there, um, there it's great amusement to me because I, I tried to help early on with the research on some personal biases. And, uh, and so I knew how to extract early on. And so if you go back, because it's not that hard for an organic chemist to figure out that you don't walk around with a great big bag of grass when you're only looking for little nubbins. If you go back through, the genes actually determine the chemotype, expression of them, what they do, what you have in the trichomes, the size of the resin heads. You can't put five gallons in a one-gallon bucket. Small resin heads, there's going to be less in there. Gender is a, is, a, is a huge part of it. Certainly that when you talk about the feminized seeds and you don't want males, there's different products you do that for. That's because the females, if they, aren't, if they don't get all the pollen, they just keep making cannabinoids. It's just like, it's like asking, hello, 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 hello. It's like a seventh grade looking for a date. You just keep calling until some male comes around. If there's no males, you just keep calling. That's the female part. Environmental factors. So when you hear the thing about, well, the 12 hours of light, not 12, how can that matter? It matters a lot. So you want to read, uh, um, so things to write down when I give you a little nugget. So you want to read David Potter's uh, dissertation. I think he got out around 2009 maybe 2007. So GW supported his dissertation, but his dissertation is 225 pages of this is how you grow cannabis. These are the lights. This is the UV. This, and everything else is banked around that. So David Potter's book is really good. John McPartland is also an adjunct professor at the University of Vermont, same as I am. And so he's a chiropractor in a small little town that he doesn't like to have people know. It's Middlebury. Oops, did I say that? So anyhow, you go back through, and he has environmental factors. So the soil, the temperature, what you put in, how you put it in, when you put it in, those are all important to the plant to optimize it. The plant will grow just fine. And then, and then you have all the other things that happen, what the different, uh, where they were grown originally. You don't take something that was made to grow in Afghanistan at 5,000 feet with no water, and then you go, gee, let's put that in Humboldt County where it's moisture in the morning, and then it dries out. It's the, the plant isn't going, the plant's going, I don't, I don't know where I am. I, I brought, my, I brought my shorts and my sunscreen, and now it's humid. That's my story. You're welcome to take any pictures of slides if you want to. I'm not that as, as Celeste's. I just give away information. It's just, you know, here you go. Um, terpenes and entourage. So Ethan Russo always, and he'll say it, Ethan Russo is one of the nicest people I've ever met. He's calm, he's humble, he's very different from me. So when we have coffee and I'm bouncing and he's going, all right, what was the first thing we were talking about? And so he's, he's very kind, um, but he's also brilliant. And he and John McPartland left about the same time from GW. But in 1893, we were already doing 
terpenoids and knowing that they were the they were the driving force. So my analogy is that the front wheel of the bicycle is the terpenes. The rear wheel is the cannabinoids. That's what drives the acceleration. But the direction that the experience goes is the terpenes. So when you walk through a pine forest and you feel better, there's a reason for that. It's alpha and beta pinene. When you squeeze an orange or, you, or you're in an orchard that's, and you feel a little bit energized, that's the limonene. Okay, so, and then there's other, my myrcene will couch lock you without cannabis. Take a lot of that sometime and you're just going to go, I can't get off the couch and I don't care. What's on TV? And I don't care. I guess it should be on, I guess, if I really care. So if I go back through, I'm always looking at modern technology to do the separation. So this is a, that's a, that's a, you know, cannabis. And then I have um, liquid chromatography here. So liquid chromatography you have a, a detector of some sort that watches the compounds go through. So you have, ma I call it magic sand. And so what happens is the magic sand is everyone's together and as you walk through the magic sand, they walk through at different rates and they separate from each other. And then you, you qualitate because they always come out at the same time It's because it's supposed to. And the height that they are determines their, their quantitation, which is all this little guy is. I should, actually, I should actually just run this just for something to do so it looks like I know what I'm doing. Never mind the man behind the curtain. Oh, I'll make up a number. I'm always making up a number. Doesn't it always make you wonder what someone's thinking? And on my side, you don't have to wonder. <laughs> it just comes out. And then the other side is supercritical fluid chromatography. So the nice thing about supercritical fluid chromatography is it will tell you the, the different chiro isomers. It'll give you great specificity. And so that's, that's the difference between the two, and it's much faster than chromatography. The other part is, is it has a lot of nice parts that allow you to know whether it's an acid or it's a neutral. So th those are the things that I use all the time on my sophisticated stuff. Um, but I just use, I use what's called thin layer chromatography. And thin layer chromatography is very similar to tie dye. And you have the different colors. The different colors are coming off at a different place. It's the same thing. It's just that, you, it's just that the cannabinoids are coming off at a different place. They look different. <laughs> this is my uh, THC. Where's my CBD? Oh, poor little hydrogen. And so what happens is I, I was once giving a, a seminar to a, to a young class, uh, young people in the class, not a young class. And I was telling them the reason that CBD comes off first is because this has a little propeller because it goes around this. this uh, and then one person said, really? And I went, uh-oh. I've done something very bad. I says, no, I'm sorry, it was a joke. And he turned really red. I said, don't worry, that I, a lot of people think that. So, which isn't true. Um, if you look back through, where did point three come from? Well, point three came from Dr. Small. He's up in Canada. So they were going back through on a specific quanti uh, quantifying case, a point three THC in a dried female tops so that you could have a dividing point somewhere. So they came up with a point three, and they come up with a point three sometimes because at which point does a psychoactive make, what's the boundary of THC for most humans? And it's, and it's less than the point three, so point three came up. A lot of people will start to feel an effect at 1%, so they use that as the point three as, as something safe. And then it went over to, went over, it's not a phone call, it's just telling me I should inject something. And so it goes back through, and, and then Europe came up with a point two, and then you have in the United States, you have different uh, uh, states that do it even differently, even though they, have, they all have the point three. I was kind of hoping I was going to find a syringe in here. Well, maybe I will, maybe I won't. So if I go back through and I, I look at the entire process, then I can say, in some states, you can go all the way to point three nine, and it's still point three. Other states is 0.29 because they don't want the 0.3. So it depends on what state you're in and how they actually do it. They also do it by GC. So they do it by gas chromatography, in which point anything that's C THCA plus the THC adds up to that. So I'll have other people that go, I could have shipped that. It was 0.2% THC. Yes, it was, but it was also 0.8% of, of a, you know, THCA that with the conversion goes over. So all those different things come into play. Now you have people wanting to have it higher. But the reason it's not higher is because of the fact it will start to make a, 
a physiological change in most humans at around 1%. I love that ring. Whose is that? I, no, 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 I like it. I, I always encourage people to have their phone on because you get to hear the different ones. Like, uh, like some of my uh, children have different ones. Like one goes, wah, wah, wah. it fits the personality. You know, so <laughs> I, know when, I know when they're calling because I know something's up. Or the one, <laughs> just okay, I know who you are. I'm getting my train of thought back. So if I'm looking at that, I have 1971. So now you start to say, how do I know what that plan is making for ratio? So there's different ways of looking at it. So this all comes again from peer-reviewed literature, and it goes back through THC plus CBN and divided by CBD. So you have THC plus CBN. So you would look at that because you're saying THC is going to go as a degradant down to CBN. There's no other real way to make CBN. So it has to have come from THC. And then you divide by the CBD, and that's what the ratio will, will typically work out. So if you have THC that's degrading, you still take that into account. It's a nice way to do it. Um, another way to do it is um, ratios that, that go throughout the plant. So again, it's blue eyes in the beginning, blue eyes in the end. But, but you can't take that plant, that plant that's made in Fred's farm and correlate it to Tony's farm tried to make it two names that were unisexual, but Fred, Fred, that doesn't do it, does it? Oh, I know. Pat. <laughs> Pat? So if you come back to you, Pat and Tony. All right, so Pat and Tony have the farms, and you, even though they're in, you know, a mile from each other, what they've grown before is important. If you grow potatoes before, it doesn't eat up a lot of soil. You grow carrots, that's a sponge, and it's going to be a very, very different plant because it's already taken a lot of nutrients. So what planted before? What's the soil like? What did they put in there anciently? So if you look at, for example, Kern County, the things that were, that were possible for those yearly, those almonds that stay around for 20, 25 years, they kept spraying them with things that were legitimately allowed to spray then. But it turns out they caused cancer. And now you're putting in a plant that loves everything. It's just like, oh, come here. It's, it's the social butterfly of high school. Come on over to Fred's house. I've got a pool. I've got a pool table. I've got potato chips. And that's a plant. It takes in everything. It takes in, so in Kern County, for example, there's a lot of cobalt because there's a lot of oil. And it takes in cobalt. It's going to take in everything. It's a remediation plant in China. Before they grow the next plant, they like to grow hemp because it sucks everything out that's a poison. Not that China's not hurting for you know, poison in their crops and stuff. Sure wish I had a syringe. Anyone got a syringe on them? Just kidding. <laughs> Oy. A man without a syringe. <sighs> Can't make it up. So, this is another one. Good is not a number. This is my tagline. It's been my tagline for like six years. Hi, my name is John McKay. Good is not a number. How does it look? It looks really good. We got a lot. It was faster. Or it was slower. And it's just like, no, that's not a number. Yellow is not a number. I don't know if you knew that. So yellow is not a number. So what you actually do is you depend on, on how you're taking the, the, the uh, statistically valid samples. So I, I was in, um, I have to have the watch because sometimes uh, I believe I'm allowed to talk for hours. I only got another 20 minutes, huh? So I was at a Rotary Club in, uh, in Vermont. Doesn't matter. I'll, I'll make it up somewhere along the way. And the average age in a Rotary Club is like 88, between 88 and 120. And, uh, and it's in the morning, so you know that they're there early because it's breakfast. And so you get scrambled eggs and bacon, which is another big surprise, and orange juice. And, and uh, so they're there, and, and they, were, they, were quite old. they were older. And I'm, I'm 65, so I brought down the average age to like 80. And um, so they... They were very much against cannabis and hemp, very much against it. You know, and you, you could tell because you had the you know, crossed arms and the rolling of the eyes, and here's this young buck. I'm thinking, nobody's called me young in a while. I love this type of eating. And so I go back through, and, and I said, uh, we're going to talk about it in Vermont, my own box, and I showed them how to do the hemp and, and things like that. And then I, I, there's always the bad boys. At 80 years old, they're still the bad boys. They're, they group together. So I've, I've taught college. I've taught high school. So I know the bad boys. And so what you do with the bad boys is they all sit together, right? They all sit together because their wives are over here. And you can tell them. So I, gave, I brought out a, a bag of um, um, uh, frosted mini-wheats. 
little tiny box. And I said, here, here's a little tiny box of frosted mini wheats. And they said, okay, open up the box. Okay, they open up the package. I said, line them all up. They line them all up. Because trust me, bad boys never want to look bad. They will be very, they're the most obedient people in a lecture. So if I ask you a question, you know where you're falling. And so I go back through and I had them all line up. I said, so they all look the same? No. Huh. Let's say that we have to measure the sugar. They have no idea where I'm, where I'm heading. You guys do. You have to measure the sugar. I says, how would you do that? You send it to a lab. Well, I take this one and I would send it. So what would you measure? Yeah, water. Good idea. What kind of water? Ice water? No, no, not ice water. Hot water. Oh, good idea. So I could take off the sugar and I could measure the sugar. What's left over? Well, the, the wheat. Yeah, the wheat's left over. I says, that's true. I says, if you brought one to the lab, does it look like the others? No. Would you get the same answer? No. How would you get a better answer? I'd send more. There's an idea. Let's send more. So now put yourself into the world of cannabis. Oh, wait. I've done one more bad things to them. And so I go back through and I says, what's on the bottom? What do you mean? I says, what's on the bottom of the package? Sugar. I says, that's the good shit. You would have thought I just said the most worst thing in the world. They're just like, what do you mean? I says, that's when you have cannabis. That's the trichomes. That's hash. Oh, <gasps> you would have thought, that's hash. I says, yeah, that's, that's all THC. That's the good stuff. I says, so this is what you want to do. If you're having a barbecue tonight, what you'd want to do is you don't want to roll it up into a ball and put it into a pipe. Because if you do that, you're going to have to have them all over because they're not going to get off the couch. They're just going to be staying over. I said, the better thing to do is that you could take it, roll it really thin, put it in a cigarette. It actually lasts better. They're still going to be hungry, but they're going to go home. And their eyes are like, oh my god! And so I, so I did that. And it was cruel, but it was fun. And so then I, they, they did go back through it. So, so if I'm a lab, I'm a farmer, and I have to give you all of my frosted mini wheats, I know what you're doing with them. I know what you're doing with them. You're smoking them. You're selling them out the back door. I know what you guys do. And so the other one was, I said, but the lab is going, I only got one, and you want me to give me an answer. Well, there's some, there are some labs that you can do that. It's called paper chromatography. And the paper chromatography is, what did you want the answer to be? 17? Oh, 17.2 good? That works. There you go. Margins on it are good. But if I go back through, you actually see that you have to have a statistically valid sample. The same thing when you have plants. You can't take plants from all around, take a leaf from every one. You've got to have the leaves from the different parts of your field. But the other thing is when you have that type of field, you want to walk around and find shack. You're looking for shack. You look across the field and you have this great big huge one going, I'm shack. And you go out there and you clip it off and you make clippings. You make, you make more of shack because the next time you want them all to be shack. And so that's what you do is you're going back through. You can see a phenotype. You can see something different. It turns out smooth peas, wrinkled, wrinkled peas really work. That's a Mendeloff reference. There are other people that are out there. This is um, um, a great chemist that came out of, uh, out of um, Europe. And so he's, he's looked at different ways of, of typing them. Instead of typing them by THC, he types them by the terpenes. It's a great paper, really well done. He went to, he, throughout one year, kept taking samples that went to one dispensary, kept it, I think it was in San Francisco, did a great job on this paper. And he finds some that are myrcene dominant some that are a lime, limonene myrcene and, and beta carophyllin, some that are, that are dominant based on the terpenes, not based on the cannabinoids. It's an interesting paper, and he does a nice job. This is another paper that's uh, really done well, and what it did is it took a multiple number of crops over years, um, varieties, and, and what he did on these is he, he looked at every single day to see what the, the differences were. When do the terpenes come out? When does CBD come out? When, when you have a THC dominant one like you have up on the top, that's a THCA, CBD um, A on the second one, and CBG A. And following those different crops, you can see as it goes through the growth cycle what's raising and what's not raising. When does the CBD peak out? You can see the CBD on the last one, it's kind of continuing to grow. The THC gets to the end way on the side and starts to go down. And the CBGA, CBGA is, your, is your, your, um, your base compound. So CBGA, when you're growing it, that's, you now have THCA synthase makes THCA. You have CBDA synthase, so CBGA plus TH, CBDA synthase makes CBDA. If you don't have the synthase, you're not making the 
the CBD8. And that's where the varieties come in. That's the biochemistry. That's the plant biochemistry, that how it actually makes each one of those. So if you do anything along the way, you can... That's when all the genomics are coming in. That's when you have CRISPR coming in. That's all the things that you can do. You influence in those. So when you hear people making the, you know, the biopharma stuff and they're doing synthase and they're doing it in enzymes, it's like making beer. That's what they're doing. They're, they're taking CBGA plus, plus a synthase and then making those individual compounds. So each one of them starts off with a starting material. You can't make something that you didn't start off with. This is what they look like. Everyone gets really excited about this slide. Then I put colors on it, so that makes it even more exciting. People are just like, oh my god, I got to have a picture of that. Look, it's got colors. And so when you have that, you're moving from the different compounds, and that's what they look like when they're flat. But they're not flat. Right? That's, I've, I've already showed you they're not flat. The Earth is flat. These compounds have dimensions. Everyone knows the Earth is flat, right? I mean, you'd, you'd be going downhill. So this is how it all begins. So this really is the chemistry of everything that we're doing. So you go all the way through, through CBGA, which is, I suppose this thing will actually have, oops, no wonder it didn't work, it didn't have a battery. I wonder if it works now. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can use the computer. Oh, uh, point to the computer, there. it's right here. No, just kidding. So if I go back, where's my CBG? Oh, come on, little arrow. Oh, I have to touch this thing. Oh, this is not gonna go well. Oh, is it going to do anything? I should not have touched that. So if I go back through, you have CBGA here in the middle. And then you have the synthase and the... Remember the uh, Krebs cycle? How many people remember at least the name, the Krebs cycle? That was a lot of fun. ATP, ADP, ATP, you know, a lot of different things. Water going here and there. So you have all these different things. So now you have these making these compounds. So when you're doing the CBN, like I was mentioning before, and knowing that ratio, it's important to be able to have that answer. Where do, you, where do you test? Test everywhere. The most simple test. Um, thin layer chromatography, it's got to be $300 total. It's very simple. You take a, a special a silica and put it on a plate, and you, you put a dot, and, the, and you do tie-dye. And then what you do is you take a picture and you remember it. And then you'll know if one dot shows up, that's where the THCA is, then, then you know what you have. This is what it does scientifically, though. On the other side, when I'm using all my tools, I like to use mass spectrometry, and I like to use little colored balls. They're, they are not the little colored balls, just so we all know that, right? And so it goes back through, and it, as you're going all the way through the purification, but the plant is starting off with that many balls. When you're asking yourself, as a grower, what do you think the U.S. government will come in? This is the paper to get, Botanical Drug Development Guidance for the Industry. December 2016, you can get it up on the FDA site. That's a good one to take a picture of because that is what they're going to do. They have good agricultural practices, good manufacturing practices. They know what a drug is and what it's not, and that's what they're going to do. All you have to do in there is instead of botanical, you write cannabis because botan cannabis is botanical. What does it look like? Remember we talked about them. These are the three major ones, and that's what happens. The bigger the ball on the end, the more is in there. What's in there is a surprise, but they're all in there. This is what they look like, so even down to the microscope, you can see that. But if you get yourself a $180 microscope from Amazon, and you stick it in your computer, you will see everything. You know, Just buy a product, and you will see the different things that are on that product. And if there's bugs on there, you watch them crawl around. This is a 1981 paper. I believe it was out of Indiana. And so they, they you can see what they did. You know, they, they went over and they, they pulled out material from the different resins and different parts in the plant. And then, remember, it's 1981. They found that there was uh, cannabinoids in there. Who would have thunk it? But that's 1981. So that was early work with chromatography. Now, fast forward to April 2019. This is a paper where they're poking the same thing, but now they have such sensitive instruments, they're looking for the synthases. They're not cannabinoids, they know where they are now. Now it's a matter of poking it and looking for the synthases. How much is the synthase, and how much does that synthase reaction give you a theoretical yield? 
So if, if I have enough synthase, in, if I have enough CBGA, and I know how much synthase there is, then I should get that much of, of THCA. What if it's not? When does it do it? When is it activated? What's the temperature? So now they're moving to that chemical reaction saying, what's the theoretical yield of CBGA plus synthase going to THCA? So that's where they are now when they're looking at that. This is what it looks like when you're knocking them off. Very sophisticated. You can use, you can use ice. It turns out ice makes things cold and then things break off. Who would have thunk it? And, it? and it works even better with dry ice. So that's how you can make the resins and you get really good hash. So there's a Rotary Club up there right now that has every Wednesday they have a barbecue and everyone stays over till Saturday. <laughs> it's not true. I shouldn't have put that on film. But the last thing I'm never. I'd like to take that back. So imaging. So then people go back through, and now we have very sophisticated equipment that we can we can do what's called MALDI. We can laser on the entire plant. Where is the THCA? Where is the synthase? And going through the whole plant. And now what they, you know, through this sophisticated work, they found out it's in, the, it's in the trichomes. And then your own business model. So on my side, the business model is there's three ways to make money. You increase revenue, decrease cost, or an optimized asset utilization. Doesn't matter if you're doing strawberries, or you're doing cannabis, or you're robbing banks, it still works. You've got to increase revenue, you know, decrease costs, Bring down the weapons. You know, don't they, I mean, it turns out we only need a couple weapons. Um, and we got to have the right guy. Last time we had Igor. Igor went over to and out. We're waiting for him. We're in front. Optimize utilization. So when you're looking at each one of those, I blow them up just so they're bigger. So when I'm looking at increased revenue, increased revenue for farmers is do I put more, do I put more crops in? Is that really a way to increase revenue? Can I optimize what I have? Might be another way. But when I'm doing this, it's, it's the time to market. It turns out the plants are not that obedient. You know, they, I've had more people say, but it was supposed to be done August 1st. Now what? I don't know. Well, maybe that cold snap in March had something to do with it. Or it rained. Or something else happened. Those are the things that come into play. The other one I talk about is, is decreasing costs. How do I make sure that I have the right equipment? How am I making sure that I don't have males if that's part of what I'm doing? Do I buy more feminized seeds up front so that my decreased cost on what I get for having to pick them out during the year? There's some people in, in, uh, in, um, in different farms. They will hire people like killing uh, oh, I shouldn't say so, killing coyotes. Um, they remove the male plants and they pay them a dollar a person, a dollar a, a male plant that comes in because it's worth it to them on the optimizing asset utilization, that that's not going to do bad things to the female. Because you're trying to say that if I get the males out early enough so nothing bad happens to my females, my females will move forward. I'm getting the five minute call, which means you have to asset, optimize asset utilization. <laughs> kind of worked out, didn't it? So human capital, <laughs> it's not actually expo e to risk, it's exposure. Just for those that are going, wow, that's a new word. And so that's, you want to be able to know, are you using the right people? Have you employed the right people? Have you got everything out in line? I've seen more processing plants and more farming things where they're just, they farmed them really close together and the rows are close together and now you can't get the water through, not to mention the human going, well, when they were seeds, it didn't seem like that much room. Okay. And it doesn't matter which part you have. It's, it's being able to, no matter what you have, it can't be the most disruptive unless you actually have something that, that works with that. So I will stop because I have four, four minutes for questions. I'm sorry I didn't leave enough time, but I tend to babble. And you know how Celeste was? She took about 10 minutes in the first part saying how wonderful I was. And, yes. <laughs> so questions? Yes, sir. It follows the same pattern where, because it's important. Yeah, so if you, for those of you, so ambient is one isomer. That's why it works. That's why they sold it for billions of dollars to a Japanese company. Ibuprofen 
is two isomers. So when you take 200 milligrams of, of ibuprofen, you're actually taking 400 milligrams because one through the FDA doesn't do anything. And the reason we have that as being important is because of flaminamide. Those of you who remember that, the terrible, terrible birth defects in the early 50s. And it was given to women during pregnancy. And during that time, it slowly made up a poison because there was a very small ice, bit of isomer that was making the poison. There was terrible birth defects. And so that's why it's so important. But it follows the same pattern. Some of the isomers don't do anything, and some of them do. That's a good question. Got to be another questions? question. Yes. One second. Let me get you this. Yep. How do you how do you manage? How big were the farms? Five hundred acres. Yeah. How do you process that all at the same time at peak maturity? How are you? You don't sleep. Yeah. Clearly. For like weeks. And you hope that they don't all come out. And it's working out in the fact that some of the ones were planted early, earlier, and there was the rain and stuff, so it kind of washed them away and they had to replant them. And some of the soil is better than others, and some are shorter than others. So, it, so genetics is working out. I didn't plan that, but it still doesn't mean I'm not going to sleep until December. Yes. And I'm going to have to take a, a different mode of, of cutting them. So I'm going to have a thresher up on top to take off the top two, two uh, feet. <laughs> because that's where most of the, the buds are going to be, and then I'll take off the bottom. So I'm, I'm not even going to take the whole plant. I'm just going to say, I'll take what I can take at this point in time, and then not sleep for weeks. All right, John, I'm, I'm actually going to have Oompa Loompas, so I'm going to have small purple you know, lab coats for everyone, and they're just going to go to the field. I've called up Charlie. He's willing to, he's willing to share. They're down that week. They're not making any chocolate. That's and that's not so bad. There's no, we didn't do any pesticides, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't run in there without a shirt. Yeah. yeah. 